Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Annunciation. Happy Greek Independence Day for those of you celebrating that holiday as well. My name is Christopher Hondros, and with me is Ross Ritterman. We are representing the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of San Francisco Church Music Ministry. How are you doing, Ross? Hey, I'm doing fine today, Chris. Thanks for uh, having me with you today. Yeah, normally we do these videos separately, but we decided for this special hymn today, we thought that we'd do this together. And the hymn that we're going to work on today and learn, and so that all of you can learn and sing with us, is the Contakion of the Annunciation, also sung in the Akathis hymn. And that Contakion is Ti Permajo, and by uh, English, it'd be O Champion General. That's right, Chris. And uh, there are some hymns in our repertoire that actually are uh, directed to be sung, in, as we would say in Greek, the choros, or as two choirs. And so for today, we'll um, sort of give people a flavor for how that could, in fact, go. And the hymn T. Parmajo, Champion General, is one such hymn that lends itself to that kind of an arrangement. Yeah, if you ever get the opportunity... Uh, to listen to Tiper Majo, uh live sung by two choirs, a left and right choir alternating back and forth, or even between clergy and choir, it is something majestic uh, to behold. And we're going to try and mimic that today. Uh, so let's see how far we get. Um, first of all, a little bit about the, um, not just the Contakion, but also the Akathist hymn. Uh, the Akathist hymn itself means without seating. Um, ideally, in this service, you'd be standing the entire time, and it is written to be stood even throughout all the petitions and stanzas and canons that it goes through. Now, the contakion that we sing with the Akathist during Lent is not necessarily one that was added initially to the Akathist, as the Akathist is attributed to Romanos the Melodist. But due to the victory style of Ti Permajo, um, we think that it was added a little bit later. Um, there's a legend that it was added and the, uh, and the Akathist was first really becoming prominent uh, during the year 626 when um, the uh, siege of Constantinople had been fended off. And so, as a result, the patriarch at the time celebrated and uh, had a giant akathist um, service where potentially they sang this hymn um, during that time in an all-night vigil. Anything more to add, Ross? Yeah, and in fact, um, yeah, a couple, uh, couple things come to mind. So one practice that is somewhat unique to um, the way we the way we Greek Orthodox do this, as opposed to how you'll see this in, in sort of Russian Russian parishes, is that we've actually, you know, so we, we talk about this as the Kontakion of Annunciation, but for those who are familiar with the Akathis services on the Friday of Lent, we, have, we of course sing this, this hymn there multiple times. However, the idea of doing the Akathis across five, um, five Fridays is actually very is somewhat unique to I believe Greek and Antiochian practice, or maybe even only Greek practice. Um, whereas there's the the Saturday of the Akathist, which is the which is actually the the day after the fifth Friday, the, the Saturday after the fifth Friday, and it's on that fifth Friday where we do the entire thing. However, these first four Fridays we break it up into sections. Nonetheless, uh, gives us an opportunity to sing Ti Per Macho many many times, and of course on the on the liturgies of on the Sunday liturgies of Great Lent, it is the Contakion that is that is sung until we get to that final um, final Sunday um, after or this after the um, after the, the Saturday of the Akathis. So I think for the first you know it's the, for the first uh, only five Sundays, but you know of course as we note here, you know the Akathis you know isn't really a, so much a Lenten thing in in its spirit. But it's because the Annunciation period generally falls between falls in in, the, in Great Lent. Um, it's something that has sort of become well, not sort of, but it has become part of part of the Lenten season and more associated with with Annunciation. 
Yeah, absolutely. And one of these, um, w one of the things to note is that, um, you know, the tie that the Theotokos has to not just Greek peoples, but all Orthodox peoples, this hymn allows it to become really a celebration of those who sing it. And, and, and like I said, there, there is a feeling of a warmth, uh, you would say, um, when, when getting mm -hmm. the opportunity to sing it. So with that being said, let's take a look at the music. And so I'm going to allow Ross to go ahead and talk about the music in uh, both Byzantine notation and we might uh, talk about it a little bit, the differences between Byzantine notation and staff. Sure. Yeah, so um, one of the things we we note by virtue of this being a contakion. So most of us know contakion as the final hymn chanted after all the apolitikion have been sung, after the small entrance at a liturgy, and then it's the final thing, and then usually the priest will say, let us pray to the Lord, Lord of mercy, if you are holy, our God. And then the next thing would be the Trisagion hymn in the liturgy. However, we know historically that uh, Kontakia were long poetic sermons, right? And so the Akathist hymn is um, one of, like, pretty much the only one we retain liturgically in our, in our repertoire throughout the entire calendar year. Um, St. Romanos the Melodist is the originator of the, of the form and um, you can find books that actually publish many of his Kontakia and uh, his Kontakia and Iki. So if you if you ever look at the Akathist service, we have the 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 Ikos and the the Kontakia, and, and then they, of course, go into the the petitions and angel, etc. Hail, hail, ever virgin bride, and and so on. And so these are you know as we know we have um, we go through um, you know all all the letters of the alphabet. It's, it's in what's called an acrostic, so it's set to some pattern. Uh, in this case, the first letter of each of those stanzas is, is, is a letter of the alphabet. Uh, point in, in sharing all that with you is what we do as a contakion most of the time is really just a very, very small piece of what it was originally intended to do. And in fact, as Chris was alluding to, there's this, you know, this famous um, all-night service that began as a result of how we, we attribute the, the miraculous deliverance of the city from, um, from the siege to the Theotokos. And so there's, there's a vigil that was celebrated. And so one of the things I'll, I'll note, and is actually still practiced in some places on the actual fifth Friday, is that this Kontakion actually has multiple settings of various lengths. So what we're going to sing for you today is going to be the most popular of them all, which is the shortest. But there's also a very, very long version what we would say in Greek, the autogro, the slow. And then there's the, um, uh, we might call it autogro syntomon, which roughly translates to the slow simple. So there's a, a, a medium length setting. And then there's this one, which is generally, again, the most popular, the one most people know and can, you know, generally hum along to or, or even hopefully even sing along to. But actually, if you look at the rubrics for that Fifth Friday, the contakion, this contakion is meant to be sung multiple times. And the first time is supposed to be, in fact, that longest of the three melodies. The next time would be the, the, next, the, the, the next fastest, and then ultimately we would settle on this one. So let's talk about the, the score itself. Uh, so we see that this is, uh, well, actually, we should see, well, I'll just call it out right now. That, oh, we do see it in the Western uh, here. It is, this is in Plagal Fourth Mode. Plagal Fourth Mode is diatonic. So we remember we have our diatonic and harmonic, and then we have chromatic within chromatic, soft and hard chromatic. Here we have um, we have di the diatonic, or we might call the soft diatonic, with a bass note of knee. So one thing to remember is that with plagal fourth mode, we actually see it in more or less two forms. We have plagal fourth mode based on knee. We also have plagal fourth mode based on ga. And plagal fourth mode based on ga, most popularly or familiarly, is seen in things like the paraklesis, both the small and the great paraklesis to the theotokos. That is a uh, ga-based plagal fourth um, canon. Um, what else can we say about this here? So um, we, as we sort of start things out, we can look at our Martyria here in the Byzantine score. 
you know, and, and typically the martyria come after phrases where we have a stop or usually like a two beat note or a three beat note corresponding roughly to where we see rests in the Western score. So we see we have this, um, we have a martyria here on pa, so we have a brief pause on the note pa. And then we have the note vu here again. And then we also see vu and then ni and then vu and then ni and so on. And so that, that's relatively expected. Um, cadence points in playable fourth mode tend to be vu or, or e in the Western scale. Uh, v is also a, um, a cadence point in, in playable fourth mode. We don't have any martyrias there, but oh, yes, we do. Never mind. Chris is circling it there with his mouse. We do, in fact, have a cadence right there on play, on on V, which is that penultimate phrase, that that actually climactic phrase right there that we see right before the end, and then we eventually end on on Ni, and then the reason for the final ending, of course, is because usually in the case of the Kontakyo, and as I mentioned earlier, something's going to come next, usually from the clergy. Uh, so we want to have a final ending to signify that hey, you know, we are, we are, we are done, and it's time for something else to to take place. Time for usually somebody else to do something that's not the the chanters or the or the choir, right? Um, let's point out a couple of things rhythmically here. Um, in this in this line here that starts with being rescued being rescued from the terrors of Theotokos. So just wanted to point out here on the word terrors, we actually have this thing called a gorgon, and we have a, next to it a dot. And so actually what that's going to do is it's going to, instead of what a gorgon normally does, which is to split notes into eighth notes, you know, a half beat and a half a beat, what we're going to do there is in fact do a third and two thirds. So this is going to sound something like, Terrors, something like that, where we again assign a third and two thirds to to these notes here. Um, that's just kind of one of these these intricacies of, of Byzantine music, being able to kind of split beats into uh, more than just these uh, more than just halves and fourths and eighths and sixteenths. Uh, one thing I, I always really like to point out about this hymn is what we do on that penultimate phrase, that phrase that um, begins, I may cry aloud. So we have this very, as I mentioned, climactic jump. This is the kind of the crescendo, the, the high point of the piece before we eventually descend all the way back down the scale and end on knee. That I may cry. And then we have the next note, after that high knee is actually a flattened or a lowered zo. Now this is, if we remember, this is one of the features of plagal fourth mode when melodies pass through the pass through or, or touch above zo and descend back down, we tend to lower the note. I bring this up because I often hear um, people sing that, that zo natural. And I think it really does affect the, the overall feeling of the, of the piece, the lowered zo really kind of says we are bringing this to resolution. There is a restorativeness to that to that lowering of the of the zo or the b there on the on the syllable uh or on the on the on the uh of allowed, and so something to um, you know just just put of. Um, and I mean those are those are kind of the. Um, the big things that that I would say stick out to me, um, Chris. Any uh, things for that you'd like to add, or or things that you also noticed that I that I maybe didn't? Yeah. So, being that we're going to take terms in tandem, verse by verse, mm -hmm. um, we have to figure out a logical way to separate um, these these verses. And so, typically, the way you would separate this hymn, if you were to do it verse by verse, between left or right choir, left choir, between clergy, choir, you would separate the first choir would end at thems. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. No, that's that's incorrect. The first, the first, at you. It would, at you, at you. Yep, that's yep. right. Because if you look at it, you in the Byzantine notation is marked with uh, three beats. Here it's mm -hmm. not as marked with three beats, but they give you a rest to kind of pick it up. Yeah. 
the uh, then the left choir or the second choir would pick up with triumphant triumphant anthems as tokens of my gratitude. Rest. Then the first choir again, being rescued from the terrors of Theotokos. Rest. That it, then it comes again. The next choir. In as much as you have power unassailable, that then rest. <laughs> Next choir, from all kinds of perils, free me so that unto you rest. Now here's the tricky part. I may cry aloud. Goes back to the first, goes back to the choir that was alternating. Then the, whatever choir uh, finishes with, will be taking that last um, ending, rejoice, O unwedded bride, or hail, O unwedded bride, depending on what translation you use. Yeah. And we can also kind of see here the form of the piece, right? Um, you know, it's basically A, B, A, B, C, D, E. Like there's this repeated phrase. Um, uh, and then again. So, and this is, and you know, we actually see that so often in Byzantine music, just the idea that we would repeat sort of the first phrase of something a second time, and then there's kind of an elaboration on it, something a little bit different. And then, of course, there, as we get toward the end with, I may cry, you know, we're doing something completely different than how this began, but we kind of see how things kind of begin with one musical idea, and then we have elaboration, and then and then things can go in a completely, um, you know, different, uh, different direction there. Yeah, and the only thing um, that I will mention before we get started here is, once again, noticing the Byzantine notation versus noticing the staff notation. Oh, champion general or champion general. So why is why are they uh, composed and basically with two different notes? How are people supposed to sing? And we have to realize that the Byzantine notation allows for ornamentation to happen. Just because it's written like this does not mean that you have to sing it exactly this way. It's more relative than that. And what you'll see is, based off uh, whatever chant school uh, you you uh, were kind of brought up in within that tradition, what village you're from, what church you you know lived at, it changes. The melody does change based off how you've been brought up with it your entire life. Yeah, absolutely correct. Yeah, so we have this notion in Byzantine music of kind of communicating the skeleton of the melody. And then, you know, and we could have written and we could very, very well have ornamented or written out analytically. Um, so this is ni 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 pa pa, ni 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 ga vu pa, which is exactly what we see in the Western. We could have written it out that way. Um, and for my own part, how I like to chant this is I might actually do that you know, what's kind of written out as an ornament, the next time I sing that phrase for some variety, I might say, oh, champion general, and then triumphant anthems, but you have that kind of freedom here. This is amongst the, you know, let's call it permissible ways to sing this within the, within the oral tradition of, of Byzantine music. And this is really one of the things that I think makes our musical kind of system so, so interesting is that you know, we, we kind of coalesce around, you know, different choices. You know, we don't say that necessarily anything goes, but uh, as Chris was alluding to, depending on how your teacher taught you, where you came from, there's going to be a bunch of, of different ways. And now that we've been singing this, you know, for what, you know, 1600, 1400 years, something like that, you know, there's, there's ideas, there's musical ideas that are in the consciousness of the people in their memories. And, and that's what we, we bring out. And so it's not necessarily an unusual thing nor a bad thing to hear this song slightly differently every time, uh, every time you hear it. Yeah, exactly. So, Ross, do you want to start us off? And then, so, uh, so Ross will be the first choir, I will be the second choir. Yep, yeah, no problem. And we'll, as we often like to do, let's try to um, <clears throat> do a, a, an epihima. So remember our epihimas are to some extent they're the old names of the of the modes but today we use them to signal to our fellow chanters choir members you know what mode we are what mode we are in uh, and thus set and then also set the bass note <laughs> oh champion general I your city now in 
transcribe to you. Triumphant anthems as the tokens of my gratitude. Being rescued from the terrors of Theotokos, in as much as you have power on the sail From the kinds of perils free me so that unto you I may cry aloud Rejoice, O So that was a lot of fun. Um, definitely something different than what we haven't done before. And I think, um, you know, while we wait for all of us to return to sing again, I think that this is a good way to learn to sing with others. You know, maybe we can't have Zoom rehearsals, but if we're learning music all together, taking phrase by phrase and singing together... Maybe we can't sing together, but we can sing with each other. Sure. And, you know, like you were saying earlier, Chris, like if um, if your priest knows this and you're not already doing it, um, maybe there's an opportunity for you to actually do this as a as a dialogue with them <clears throat> while you are um, while you are doing this in church today. Or, yeah, as such time that we actually get back to get back together, whether you're um you know, uh, two chanters across, you know, two chant choirs across from each other or um, a choir who um, positions themselves up in a loft. Uh, the idea of even, you know, having half the people do one line and the other half doing the, the other line, you know, certainly makes for, you know, a good oral effect as well. But, you know, it is this idea of this, this idea of dialogue, as I was mentioning earlier, is, is something that is a part of our, our repertoire. Some um, some hymns uh, like during Holy Week, uh, the Royal Hours of Theophany um, are actually originally written, uh, or at least at one point were written for multiple choirs. So this is definitely definitely a thing, an idea that one choir would sing. You know, in, the, in this case, it's one phrase, but it could be that one choir sings maybe several lines, and then the next choir picks up with the rest. So you know, definitely um, something that can be be done uh, as as part of uh, your musical program. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you once again for joining us. Um, I know this was a long uh, recording. We thank you for uh, staying and listening through. Hopefully you found it informative. Hopefully you got something out of it. And if not, you know, maybe this gives you an idea um, of how to, once again, still congregate without physically congregating yet as we wait uh, for our churches to open up more and more so that we can gather together in person. Once again, thank you. Have a great evening and happy, blessed Annunciation. Yes, Kalikasarakosti, happy Annunciation. Good to see everybody. <laughs>